Hello, my pack, my tribe. Welcome to Howling After Dark. So, uh, tonight's show is a little different, and it's not necessarily paranormal. Um, but it is a topic I've been wanting to talk to you about for quite some time. A lot of people don't know this, but, uh, I'm not currently, I don't think, um, as I need to be recertified, but I was a certified diver. And so I've always been fascinated by uh, <clears throat> certain places in the world that I would never actually dive um, because they are far too dangerous. Um and these stories have been coming out, uh, particularly I uh, listen to um, Mr. Ballin. If you're unfamiliar with his stuff, uh, check him out on YouTube. It's fantastic. He talks about all sorts of weird, creepy, mysterious stuff. And he covers like these stories about, uh, you know, mysterious disappearances, weird deaths, things of that nature. And uh, one of the his favorite topics are uh, sites like we're going to get into tonight. These dive sites that are so incredibly dangerous, they regularly kill people. All right, so any of you, uh, one second. All right, so uh, let's get into it. So I'm going to list these off, and then uh, as I list them off, I'm going to tell you stories about them. All right. So uh, these are the uh, six of the most dangerous diving sites in the world. Um, the first one up tonight is called, it's nicknamed the Temple of Doom. Uh, it's the Cenote Calavera in Tulum, Mexico. Uh, this underground labyrinth is one of the most challenging of Mexico's famous cenote sinkhole sites, taking divers through a disorienting maze of limestone tunnels, ledges, and caverns. A rickety pipe ladder leads through a seven-meter hole into a multi-level cave system filled with a mix of sea salt and fresh water. It's lit by beams of sunlight through three openings, but get out of the sunlight, and it's incredibly easy to get lost. Okay, so so to explain further about this, it it is a labyrinth. It's not joking when it says it's a labyrinth. There, there are literally tunnels and caves all over this. It is very easy to get lost. A lot of them are named. Some of them aren't because they've never been explored. Because they're far too deep. And to explain that, I'll explain that like this. So if you get a, just go out, pay your money, take the classes, do your training dives, you know, as a civilian, you're only cleared to go 120 feet. Okay, there's a reason for this. In order to go deeper than that, you have to be on a special mixture of gas, right, in order to dive that deep because of the nitrogen content, because otherwise you will get something called nitrogen narcosis. It's basically like being drunk, but picture this. You're, you're, you're basically inebriated, 
but you're inebriated in a space that is pitch black, 360 degrees around you, your judgment is now hindered and you have no idea which way is up. Add to that all the dangers that are down there, including things like sharks and other sea animals that basically want to kill you. It's a bad mix, is what I'm getting at. Okay? Now, to be a Class 2 or a commercial diver, you have to be trained in a special mix of of gases, which is, uh, I want to say it's oxygen and nitrogen, but I don't really remember. Regardless, it doesn't matter. It's a, it's a special mix of gases, and it, I remember the taste. It tastes kind of weird. Um, or at least it did to me. In any case, not the point. So you have to be on the special mix of gases so you don't get nitrogen narcosis. And then you are only cleared to go 300 feet. Okay. The deepest parts that they know of in this system of caves in the cenote go down to 600 feet. That is twice the depth that you're cleared to as a standard commercial diver. Okay, that's not deep sea diving. That's just standard commercial diver. But still, that should tell you everything you need to know about that. Because the hardcore commercial divers are cleared down to, I think, like, a thousand feet, two thousand feet, something like that. But they also have special gear and they don't stay out in the water forever. They actually have this thing called a bell that they can retreat to to get fresh oxygen and stuff. But that's a whole other ball game. In any case, so here, here's this one story. So, uh, there was these two guys. Uh, one was this guy named, uh, David Winters. He was from England. He was just a standard, uh, certified diver. He just received his certification just a couple of weeks before this trip down to Mexico. And he was with this guy who was, uh, I'm not clear on if he was certified or not because, uh, the, the local, like, uh, regulations aren't like they are everywhere else, I guess. Uh, his name was Jose. I don't recall his last name. So David and Jose, they go down into the Temple of Doom. Cenote Calabar. And when when you first go down, there's there's the entrance they call the parlor. Okay, so you go in through the parlor and then you have a choice. You can go right, and if you go right, you go into um another cavern system that goes from about a hundred feet down to about 200 feet down. All right. And it's called the chamber. And then at the bottom of the chamber, there's another opening. And inside that opening is a chamber named after tonight's episode or vice versa called Deep Six. And the reason it's called Deep Six is it goes from 300 to 600 feet down. Almost nobody ever goes in there. But the few that do, half of them, only, only less than half of them actually come back. And 
every time they have issues because almost every time somebody's stupid enough to go in there, they're not, you know, uh, uh, licensed or certified to dive that deep. And therefore don't really know what they're doing, which is just asking for trouble. And in this case, that's what happened. So they, they, they went through, uh, you know, the, the first chamber, they went into the next chamber and they're at the entrance to deep six. And the entrance to deep six is, is, uh, fairly small. In order to get through it, most people would have to take their tank off and push it in front of them. Okay. Because you, there's, it's so tight. There's no way really to leave your tank on your back and swim through. Uh, you would have to be an incredibly small person in order to do that. So, uh, you know, David is very gung ho about going into this other chamber. He wants to go check it out. I don't even think he realized how how dangerous it was or how deep. And Jose is like he's like pointing to their gauge, you know, saying, "You know, come on, let's go. We gotta go. We gotta go." But and so Jose turned around and he went to leave thinking that David was going to be right behind him, but David went into deep six. Jose goes back up towards the parlor, you know, thinking that they're going to get out, and he's almost to the entrance from the second chamber into the parlor, and he realizes David isn't there. And so he turns around and he swims back and he goes to the entrance of deep six and he doesn't see David. But, you know, he's responsible for this guy. And so he goes through into deep six and he's looking around. And to give you an idea about how big deep six is, you literally cannot from the entrance, right? If you have a high beam, high beam, diving flashlight, it will not touch the far wall. That's big, especially since we're talking about clear water here. There's no silt down there. It's actually so deep that silt, well, it does exist that deep, but because that ca- that cave system is so big, the chances of you kicking up the silt are very diminished. So the water is generally pretty clear, and he cannot see him. He has no idea where he is. So Jose turns around and he books it back up to the surface and he calls for help. Well, by the time help gets there, they can't go down immediately because it had started to rain. They had actually started to get uh, one of the biggest rainstorms in recent history. And so the, the cenotes were were filling up and because they were filling up is actually causing a dangerous current that that uh like a riptide would have just pulled them down to the bottom and held them there so they had to wait so like a week later um rescue divers with special equipment actually went down into deep six and where they found david 
he was up near the surface where there was this little, like, air pocket. And he, his, uh, his gear, his, uh, tank, one of the straps on his tank actually got caught on a little rock outcrop. And he was literally a foot away from air. Which wouldn't have mattered anyways, because even if he had gotten to the air, he would have had to have gotten enough air into his lungs and done a breath hold from deep six all the way up. All because he didn't listen to his, his you know, his uh, guide, Jose. As it was, when Jose went back, he was out of air. He had to do a breath hold. From the entrance to deep six all the way back up to the surface because he was out of air. That's crazy. All right. The, this next one. I'm going to kind of have to tell a story about this one. It's called Deep Older or Dipolder. It's D I E P O L D E R. I know it sounds German, but it's actually located in Florida. And it, it, I'm just going to read you this little, little tidbit of this article about it. Um, this may look like a normal pond from the surface, but beneath the water, it drops down. 110 meters into the deep older two and three cave system Con continental america's deepest cave <laughs> discovered in 1978 it's entered through a 60 meter long vertical tunnel that goes directly down into a 30 meter high cavern with incredible pinnacles of rock rising up six meters from the cavern floor it is it is very beautiful. I will tell you that. It is gorgeous down there. It's like being in another world. And I could link um, videos of it uh, that are on YouTube about it if you really want to check it out. But it is incredibly dangerous because it's a maze. And because there is silt down there uh, in deeper levels it is very easy to get disoriented and lost. And it is so deep, by the way, that uh, they are estimating that about 90% of the entire system is unexplored. So it goes from deep older, I guess, one, which is, you know, the surface water down to deep older two to deep older three. And that's as far as they've gone. It goes further than that. And here's my story about deep. <laughs> um, so this is a personal story. I nearly died in Deep Older 2. Um, and it, it wasn't my fault, honestly. It, it wasn't really anybody's fault. It was just one of those things that can go wrong in diving. So uh, basically what happened is we went uh, through Deep Older 2 into Deep Older 3... And when we were looking around in Deep Older 3, when I realized that I'm almost out of air, and the reason I realized that is because uh, one of the safety features that, that they have on uh, some tanks, depending on who you get it from, uh, but this, this uh, one particular 
um, tank, I was really good. And, and it was very highly recommended to me by uh, uh, Philip Cousteau, who was the, the son of Jacques Cousteau. And uh, the reason being is because uh, instruments can fail, but, you, but your senses never will. And what this tank does is it actually changes the flavor in your mouth. It gives you a very bitter taste when you're almost out of air. Right. I don't, I don't know the specifics of how they do it or whatever, but it's just the way this particular tank is designed. And uh, the company that made them, I'm not even sure if they're around anymore, but they were called Noxygen. You know, like Nox, Noxygen. Anyways, uh, <clears throat> so that I hit that taste, and I'm about 120 feet down. So basically, my heart starts fucking pounding because I'm thinking I'm in serious trouble. I'm thinking I'm going to have to go on a breath hold and book it back up, which was true. I did. Uh, I had forgotten about a uh, diver's aid system and uh, there's other names for it, but uh, what diver's aid system is, is it's, it's this device that's attached to your gear and uh, it's got a little cord with a like a red or orange handle on it and you pull it and it inflates this balloon that that uh raises you to the surface rapidly the downside to it and the reason why a lot of people forget about it is because uh if you uh ascend too quickly you can actually get what's called diver sickness or the bends um which if you've ever been through it it's fucking horrible because you, you, when you're deep, you have these things called uh, compression stops or dive stops. And uh, the deeper you are, the more stops you have to do. So at, a hundred, at 120 feet, you have to do three stops, typically. Right? You have to do one at about 90 feet, one at about 60 feet, one at about 30 feet, and then you're up. Right, I blew through all the stops because I was certain I was letting fear at that time take over my brain. I wasn't thinking, and and I actually did get uh, the bends. And uh, the way they have to treat it is you have to go into a uh, a pressure chamber that basically mimics the depth of 120 feet under the water or however far under the water. And then it slowly decreases pressure until your pressure is normalized and you can go out onto the surface without, you know, getting violently ill and possibly dying. And so for, for, uh, it was basically two days in a pressure chamber for me. Uh, they only really had to do one day, but they did two just to be safe, I guess. Anyways, so that was my, my personal deep holder story. Uh, number three on the list is one that a lot of people are becoming familiar with nowadays. I keep hearing it come up in conversations here, of all places. It is called the Blue Hole. It's located in Dahab, Egypt. It is arguably the most dangerous... Uh, cave diving location in the world. 
This underwater tunnel featured in Luc Besson's 1988 film, The Big Blue, goes down 120 meters. For those that aren't familiar with meters, by the way, 120 meters is about 300 feet. Okay. And has a reputation as one of the world's most dangerous dive sites because of the risk of nitrogen narcosis disorientation. Handled with care, however, it awards expert divers who reach its famous underworld arch 56 meters below the surface with an adventure through a 26-meter-long tunnel out to a giant opening into the Red Sea. If you actually were to make that tunnel and not go deeper, which is like the going deeper part is what kills most people. Um, that would be an experience and a half because the current would actually carry you through the tunnel. So you could kind of relax and just look around. Oh my God. Got an experience sort of with this one too. Uh, not personal like the last one, but you know, I was there for it. It was me, this guy Rodney, this other guy Paul, and this kid named Ricky. I call him a kid, but he he was only like a year or two younger than us. Anyways, uh, we all went here. It's a place called The Shaft. It's in uh, Mount Gambier, Australia. Uh, This giant cave system is entered through a tiny manhole in the middle of a field. Yep. It leads down a narrow 8 meter long shaft to a water filled cave from which two tunnels one at either end descend to depths of either 85 meters which is around about 200 feet to 120 meters which is 300 feet. Gear has to be lowered down to divers through the shaft because it is too tight to fit through. Wearing it, and I mean, it opens up once you're through the the entrance tunnel. The site is carefully controlled by the Cave Divers Association of Australia with dives now restricted to 40 meters, which is a good fucking thing. This is why it's so dangerous. It, it does go down to 300 meters, but it actually goes deeper. All right. There is an opening down there at the bottom. Okay. Where, where if you were to take off your tanks and push them in front of you, you could technically fit. The reason you don't want to do that, though, is because there is a underwater whirlpool that you can't see it it is a massive downdraft that will suck you in like a fucking vacuum right most of us were aware of it because we asked about it right because for most of us this was our second trip here but Ricky hadn't gone with us the first time And so we went down there, we turned around, and we started heading back, right? And going down there is is kind of a no-no anyways, because we were only certified for 120 feet. We were at almost 300 feet, right? Which is kind of a no-no, because you can get nitrogen narcosis, but we'd done it before, so we we're like, whatever, you know, young and dumb, whatever. Anyway, so we all start heading back. We all get up to the surface just fine. We all actually climb back up our rope that we had lowered down this manhole sized uh, opening so, and climb back up, you know, and after we'd hauled up our gear. And we're all standing around the opening of the cave. And we just kind of got the feeling like something wasn't right. And then it dawned on us. 
Like, where the fuck is Ricky? Well, it turns out Ricky decided that he was going to try and go down that little sh- little shaft at the bottom and got sucked in and drowned. But, yeah. Now, this next place is a place I won't dive, ever. If you offered me a million dollars, hell, if you offered me a billion dollars to go dive here, I would tell you to fuck off. Because of how dangerous this place is. It's called the, the Samusan Hole. And it's at the Samusan Islands of Thailand. It's not for the faint hearted. This spot in the Gulf of Thailand drops 85 meters down to a former military dumping ground where the seabed is littered with unexploded bombs. It requires experience and high-tech equipment to reach its greatest depths where sunlight rarely penetrates. Unless done done at slack tide, divers can drift miles from their start point into a busy area for tanker traffic. Yeah, no thanks. All you had to tell me was unexploded bombs. I want you to picture this. To go into a bit more detail, the reason why there are so many bombs here that are unexploded is because this particular area of Thailand was controlled by the Japanese during World War II. It was attacked by the good old U.S. of A. There are all sorts of shit down there. There's, there's, uh, you know... Ships and aircraft and bombs and everything else down there. So, yeah, no thank you. And I don't have any stories for that place because I'm sure there's a lot, but it's not one that they would ever really advertise. I, I don't even think it would make the news there, to be honest with you. I. I can't picture them going, oh, another idiot was exploded down down at Samson Hole. Again, today, you know. This is one of those things. All right. This last one, I've never been to. I've, I've heard about it. I've always kind of wanted to go, at least through part of it. Not that I'm afraid of danger or anything, but I also have a healthy respect for life, primarily my own. The Eagle's Nest. It's in uh, Wikiwachi, Florida. It's a underwater cave system. It's known as one of the. It is known as the Mount Everest of cave diving. It is. Uh, Closer, cooler water is yet from the surface. It looks like nothing more than a scum-covered pond. The the cave system reaches depths of up to 90 meters and begins with a narrow chimney-like descent into the main ballroom, which then leads onto long tunnels and narrow passages, making snaking further underground. Now, here's why it's dangerous. You go into the main ballroom, and that's fine because there's actually plenty of sunlight that that uh, comes down that kind of illuminates things a bit. Even though the the entrance isn't that big, 
but it's big enough. But, uh, what makes it so dangerous is you go into, uh, any, any like tunnel or cave branching off of that. There is no ambient light. And that's what's killed most people in the, in this spot is the fact that there's no ambient light, like their flashlight fades out or they didn't bring one for some reason. And now they can't tell where they are or where their position is in relation to up or down or east, west, anything. So people literally get lost there and die because you only have so much oxygen. It is not the deepest cave system as far as what most people go to. But it can get very confusing if you're not careful. So there it is, folks. Your deep six. I will give a shout out to uh, honorable mention, I guess you could say, uh, Chuck Lagoon. Let me read you up on it real quick. It's in the Caroline Islands of Micronesia. It is a wreck site, just like I was saying before with the unexploded bombs. Uh, buried beneath the water in this remote region of Central Pacific is the remains of a Japanese naval base and all the boats and planes that went with it, including the well-preserved San Francisco Maru. Discovered in 1969 by Jacques Cusseau, the 117-meter-long cargo ship site on the seabed 63 meters down with its deck around 50 meters from the surface, and its hull contains mines, torpedoes, three tanks, and several old trucks. Yeah, anytime you bring unexploded old-ass ordnance that's at the bottom of the ocean into play, that's a site I will go nowhere near because it's only a matter of time. Because the the salt and the rust will, over time, dissolve the shell around an unexploded bomb. And then what do you think happens? Boom. So no thank you. Anyway, that's about all the time I have. Until next time, I pack my tribe. Peace. Out.